So what is it? Next one is the 28th. Gosh, it's almost May. Uh, and of course, there's going to be one one other homework that's going to um, be a week from that, and that's probably going to be our last class. Okay, so um, yes. Is it going to be second to come or is it? Final exam will be take home. So yeah. So what I uh, handed in here is handed out is um, partial solutions to homework. Um, so I can I kind of give you the solution to part A of each problem. I hope. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, well, so. And you still have to fill in a few blanks. I mean, it's one of those classes where you have fill in the blanks, right? Those are nice classes. Um, so I left like a numerical computation. So we'll talk about this a little bit today and just give you a head start. Um, and we'll continue talking about probability models. Uh, certainly talk about uh, this. We need to talk about continuous probability models. Um, so continuous, continuous random variables, and uh, then look at some of these applications, some of the concrete applications. But let me let me say from the beginning, if some of you have started looking at the homework, um, is that it, it, there's again a learning curve um, as to how to interpret these problems. And how to um, you know successfully or efficiently solve them, right? Uh, you have to de develop sort of the model. So it goes back to pretty much that five-step uh, method. Um, you start by reading the problem, <coughs> digest it, then uh, then you start building the mo you know the mathematical model, right? So you decide what tools you need, right? Yeah. Well, we're in the chapter with probability models, so uh, you use either discrete or continuous models. Um, then you build it, right? You build the model, and you build the model by selecting variables, okay? Selecting parameters, figuring out what are the assumptions, what is known, what is assumed, right? What is something that's certainly given to you, set in stone? What's something that you have to infer, you know, uh, make assumptions? Then use one of these kind of um, heavy machinery that probability theory gives you. So we're going to talk about central limit theorem today. Um, right? Solve the model, interpret the results, come up with your kind of lay, um, you know, explain the, explain the conclusions. Um, and I think the it, it, it will depend on how how much exposure to probability you've had in be, being able to accomplish each of these steps successfully. Okay, so if you didn't have too much probability, then it might be a little bit difficult to um, you know argue that something is you know there's there's only correct one correct answer. Versus, there could be, you know, um, possible different interpretations for the same question or for the same problem. Okay, um, and as you can see, I mean, as you can imagine, in the deterministic systems until now, there was little little room for, uh, well, for interpretation. I mean, there was. If you knew you had to come up with a deterministic model, then you know that was pretty much it. And then you, so we didn't have too much to uh, um, debate on. But here it's it's more of the nature of the problems where there is un uncertainty, right? There is randomness um, that you're going to get certain things that may or may not be intuitive to you. And so if they're not intuitive, you're gonna, not going to be able to to um, to give a very good interpretation to the to the outcomes. Okay, so I think the way to to approach this process here is is to um, 
try to see how um, cert these kind of problems get um, uh, how this kind of how, how this models get built and sort of make a epsilon step step and try to apply this um, skills to maybe similar situations okay but uh, unless you know a lot of you know stochastic modeling for which we have a different course right then so know the limitations we're not going to be able to move too far away from the type of examples that we talk about. Okay? So, I hope that's useful and well, this comment should be um, helping you in kind of dealing with um, the problems we, we talk about. So, um, so first let's, let's set the stage here. So, we're going to talk about continuous random variables and um, the random variable still remains to be as a function. So we're still going to talk about. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm switching from S being the sample space to omega, and there is a reason for that. But it's not. Essential, but it is uh, to indicate that now the sample space is likely going to be, you know, the number of outcomes is going to be not just a discrete set, the set of outcomes, so s space of possible outcomes of an of a, of, a, of a certain experiment, right? So it may be actually something in in the plane, it may be something on a line, it may be something, right? Not only that, but you have a function that takes every right. So every element in this, every outcome gets assigned a certain real number. So you make an observation for each outcome for each run of your experiment. You make a, a certain observation. That's a random variable. Now. In the continuous case, um, first of all, why, why, what do we, what will mean that this is a continuous versus a discrete? So x is uh, needs to be a nice function. And by nice, we kind of mean it's, uh, there's a more technical term called measurable function, but um, I don't know. Think about it as some sort of it's a, it's a function that's compatible with a probability that's that's assigned to L F events here. So, so, so if I have some sort of um, right, I'm going to have events in this in this experiment, right? This is subsets of the set of all possible outcomes, right? So if I have an event like that, um, what we want is we want that, um, so by this, by saying that x is nice, we say that x, excuse me, that, that omega The set of omegas for which x of omega belongs to some interval, let's say a to b, has a probability assigned to it. So, in other words, we're going to be able to talk about the probability of this event, right? So, let's call this, this event a. So you can rewrite this as, as follows. Kind of the shortest possible way is, uh, sorry, the next shortest possible is, uh, this is between B and A, right? So again, keep in mind, we're <clears throat> when we talk about the probability of, of an event, we just simply say, we describe that event, right? So this event would be 
that the random variable takes values between two fixed numbers. Correct? Or the shortest way, as I said, possible uh, in which you might be able to write this is this. So it's like you don't write the little omega anymore. Right? No, if this is for continuous. Okay. Of course, it's also true for discrete, but for discrete, this is the fact that, that I'm, I'm looking at the. So the fact that I'm looking at this, so I'm taking a set of all possible events and I'm mapping it by this x into the real line, right? Um, that's that's what a random variable is, right? And then I'm saying maybe this I want to I'm interested in when this random variable takes values in this interval, right? So I'm looking at all possible outcomes here that actually are mapped in that, right? So that's that's how I make this. So this this would be the event omega is such that x of omega belongs to a b, right? And by the way, another way of writing this is the inverse, x inverse of the interval a b. Okay? Now, if the random variable were discrete, then in this interval a to b, x would only take <coughs> Accountable, let's say a finite number of values, right? So then you could reduce this event to a union of the events when each of those values is actually being achieved. So again, it makes makes sense to think of this pre-image is called um, of this interval in the sample space especially when, when the random variable is continuous. That is, the range of values of x is an interval or something. Okay? So, what would be an, what would be an example like that? Just think that you have a pen or some dot, some something, something really small, right? Like a pin, right? Um, and you just throw it on the on a table, right? That's an experiment that's random, right? Um, you're never gonna right get to a specific do point. Point, uh, and then you can say, well, I'm gonna take the random variable to be what? Give me an example of a continuous random variable. For instance, it could be the location of where this pin lands, right? As measured from that edge or something. So then it could actually have all possible distances between whatever, 0 and 10 centimeters, right? So it's a continuous range. If you counted how many times the pin bounced, is that... No, it's the, fir the first contact or something. Simplest possible event, oh. right? The simplest possible experiment, yeah. Um, well, you're starting. You have to start somewhere. So maybe, maybe it's the yeah. Maybe it could be the distance that it bounces back, or some you know. So it could be some numerical value that you assign to each run of your experiment, right? So that makes it a it's a continuous range. Um, or it could be just well, what I'm what I just said is is actually it, it can. I I only said it's. Uh, Excuse me. I only said I said that you can actually throw it anywhere on this on this uh, line on this uh, plane. But but uh, think about it on a line, right? You throw it on a line where it hits. You know that's a random variable, right? Um, and then you can talk about the probability that um, that random variable is between certain intervals, right? A certain range. So, for instance, if you have an interval that's very, very small, the probability is going to be small that you're going to hit that interval, right? 
Whereas if you have an interval that's large, it's going to be a larger probability, right? Still less than one because, as I said, you you have to assign a probability to that uh, to that event to each to each such event, right? Okay. And there there are several several things that I won't be able to talk about this of why this is you know wh how come not every function like this is is nice well the reason is oh that's kind of hidden but it says that not every subset of that sample space may have a probability assigned to it so you right when we talk about discrete set if in previously we talked about a set a sample space which was right let's say a finite or, or a countable many or something then you know what all the subsets of, of that set is, right? So you know all the events. You, and you can, if you do counting, you know how to assign probability. <coughs> Whereas if you have a, 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 a continuum set of, of, of outcomes in your, in your experiment, then not every single subset of that continuum may, be, may have a probability assigned to it, right? So, so your experiment should include also the so the setup should include the probability, right? So, so every time, so uh, we need a, a sample space and a probability that assigns probability measure for uh, a set of events okay anyway so this come uh, kind of this is this is kind of the starting point in this modeling you need you need to identify these things and of course you need to identify the random variables as well okay okay so let's let's see what do you do or how do you describe random variables so maybe I'll shade this so you can understand this mapping here okay. so uh, in a way the 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 analog of the counting of the of the pro so you say a pro uh, an event has a probability what the number of possible of uh, favorable outcomes divided by the number of all, all possible outcomes right what would be the equivalent in in uh, in for continuous Sample for, for 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 the continuous random variable. Oh, excuse me for sample spaces that are like a real line, and I'm having that experiment of throwing a dart. Yeah. So what would be the probability of an interval, for instance, that that you land in that interval? Could be the length of that interval compared to the length of the whole. The whole region that that you you know so right so the smaller the length the smaller the probability the higher the length right so that's just an example but you have to define that okay so uh, so so again the the the, uh, the properties uh, are the same for as for the discrete so the first one is the probability of any event has to be positive for any event A for which you assign a probability. The probability of the entire sample space is 1, so that's the certain event, right? You're always... And the probability of a union is the sum of probabilities for any mutually disjoint um, sequence of events or mutually incompatible if you want so that says that in my you know sample space I need to have things that are disjoint right Mutually disjoint. 
Okay, so it's not it's not any more counting thing, but it's if you think about this length of interval and then union of intervals, right? If I have an interval here, an interval there, an interval there, and I say what's the probability of landing in the union of all, in, in one of the three, right? It's going to be the sum of the lengths or the sum of the probabilities. And this actually can go with infinite infinite uh, sequence. Okay. So, do you do you check this? Uh, no. It's oftentimes you just work with a pro probability space or space uh, sample space with a probability assigned to to, to the events uh, that are you know that you have experience with. But these are the properties that define a probability space, basically. Okay. So, so um, let's define a probability distribution. of a continuous random variable so so by definition that's a function so the random variable x capital X so the probability distribution is going to be a function of define on little x for for a real number x, right? And it's it's the probability of the event that capital X is at most little x. So again, this this would the long way would be what the probability that of the of the set of outcomes for which. Yep. For which this capital X has values at most little x. Okay. So this this is this can be defined for any for any real x. Um, why? Well. You see, even if even if our random variable only takes positive values, right? Let's say I'll, my random variable is a distance, right? I can still define uh, uh, the probability distribution for negative little x's, right? What will be that prob What will be that uh, value? If I have a random variable that's always positive, and I'm, I'm I'm saying I'm looking at the probability of the event that x is less than negative two. That's that's an empty set. That's an empty event, right? So it's an impossible event. So its probability is zero, right? So this this function is just simply going to be zero from negative infinity all the way to wherever the first value of the random variable takes place, right? So this again is a function from R to R. Actually, it's true that it's from R to R, but it's you can see that being a probability, it's actually the values of the probabilities are between zero and one. Yeah, so it's a function. It's a function, and and it has a lots of properties like like uh, I think it's uh, right continuous or something. So is right continuous. It's not necessarily continuous. Um, well, maybe I'll give an example, but um, either right or left continuous. I think it's right continuous. Um, so the best way to understand this is to graph it, right? I mean, if you can graph it, that's what you do to understand the probability di distribution. It is similar to, well, it's not quite similar to the histogram. In the discrete random variables, when we said when we said I'm going to plot the number of or the probability that the event takes a certain value, right? One, two, three, four, like right, discrete set of values, and then I have this graph. Um, 
here there is something similar to that, but uh, but because it's it's continuous random variable, then you have a continuous range, right? So so here's here's an example. So there are some very important properties of of of, uh, of, of f. Uh, so one we said this. So we said that. This is always between zero and one because it's simply a probability. Uh, one of the more important one is f is increasing function. Okay, so what does it say? Increasing. It says that if I have two values for little x one and little x two. Um, you can compare the two events, the, the event when the capital X, our random variable is less than x1, and the, the event when the random variable is less than x2. One is containing the other as sets of outcomes. Which one, go, which one is where? Which one is containing which? If one of them happens, the second, the other one must happen as well. It's just a matter of of, re of saying it back in your in your head is in words basically. But if we know that x two is occurred in x one, still left x two. So you're saying this is included in this. That this is included in this, right? Because if if I if I throw the die, right? If I if I if I run the experiment once and I measure the random variable, right? And it's less than x1 because x1 is less than x2. It's also going to be less than x2, right? So so every outcome in this set in this event is also going to be an outcome in this event. Now, because of this inequality, inclusion, um, and of course the properties, the properties of the probabilities. If I have a, a smaller set and a larger set, both of them are events in two events. Then the probability of the smaller event is of, of the uh, yeah of the smaller set is less than the probability of the larger set. Okay. So this just says f of x1 is less than f of x2. Of course, for x1 less than x2. So this, this says that f is increasing. Okay, So it's always going to have this pattern. Now, of course, as I said, it might actually be zero for a long time and then, you know, increase and it possibly be one after a while, right? For instance, if if the actual pro if the actual uh, uh, random variable has values in some interval, bounded interval, right? Uh, okay, and and the third property is this half is continuous, f is right continuous. What does it mean, right continuous? It means that the value of x. Uh, at at a certain x is the same as the value at the limit from the right, which again is the limit as f as y approaches x, y greater than x. Right. So, so, so the picture here is that is something like this. Of 
course, one is here, zero is here. But at some point, you, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, it will not. It, it can have jumps. Of course, only increasing. It can only go up with jumps because f is increasing. Uh, but I think the value at, at that endpoint is going to equal to the limit from the right. Okay. And again, this follows from from that property that you can take in property 3 here, that you can take unions uh, countable, no, countable pro uh, sets, okay? Uh, actually, it's worth to put, put up another property, which is that um, not only that f is between 0 and 1, but also the limit at, at infinity of f is 1 and the limit at negative infinity of f is 0. So, so it really says that it goes, you know, it, it never, it doesn't increase and then stay below 1. It goes towards 1. And again, that's again a property of that union, pro, uh, uh, probability of the unions is the sum of the probabilities, right? Am I saying t something totally new here, or have you seen this in, pl in previous pla in previous places? I mean, we could spend time and, and go through this, prove all of these things, but I think it's it's not a one. Of, it's not a one of our um, goals here. Um, okay, so. Let me just introduce one more thing that's probability density function. So that's to to uh, to compare to the contrast with the probability distribution. So again, you have a continuous random variable x is. Simply the derivative of this capital F, uh, assuming the derivative exists, right? So assuming F uh, is differentiable at x. Now, <coughs> so F F being the probability that our random variable is little x, okay? Now, keep in mind this is all attached to a, to a random variable. So you have a random variable, it comes with a probability distribution, and it comes with a probability density function, assuming that, you know, you can take the derivative. So, and th there, are, there are ways to, so for instance, if you have a jump, you cannot take the derivative, right? So if your probability density function distribution has a jump, like I plotted before, you won't have a derivative there, right? But if, for instance, it's continuous, right? Uh, if it's continuous and increasing, there are there are results that say that you have derivatives almost everywhere. Okay. In fact, if it's an increasing function, it almost has uh, deriv derivatives almost everywhere. Okay. So, so two two key properties. Uh, probability density function, which are sometimes called PDFs, right? Uh, of PDFs. Well, first of all, it's a positive function if it exists. Of course, we're talking about cases when uh, when we have this um, differentiability. So if it's, if it's always positive, right? Because it's a derivative of, of a increasing function. And what's more important, though, is the way in which you use this
and use this uh, density function to, def to, to compute probability of the event, of that key event, of the event when x is between two fixed values, and that's the simply the integral. Now, why is that? So that's very important. Why is this? Well, what's the integral from a to b of f of x dx? Simply the integral of f prime, capital F prime, right? So that's f of b minus f of a, fundamental theorem of calculus. Yep. Okay, so that's f of b minus f of a. So what is f of b? Probably the large the X, capital X is less than B, less than or equal than B, minus the probability that large X is less than or equal than A. Right? Now this one is this this is a small is a subset of this, right? It's a sub event, or I mean, it's a, it's a I don't think we use sub events, but this is a subset of outcomes of this. So the 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 difference is the same as the probability of the event when when uh, when it's kind of a difference between these two events, right? So it's when x is less than or equal than b, but not less than or less or equal than a. So it's greater than greater than a and less than or equal than b. Okay. How many of you have not seen this before? Okay, everybody's saying, okay. So maybe we should just cancel the class, huh? So so it's a good thing to, to I mean to um, fix this in your in your memory because uh, we're, you know it's used throughout and of course the other way to re to remember this is I have a function that's positive, right? So, so when I'm plotting little f, which is simply the derivative of that probability di distribution function, right? So that was that uh, probability distribution function was kind of increasing, so the derivative is positive. But also there's this other property that being increasing and then leveling off at one and starting from zero, it means the derivative has to go back down to zero. So the, I mean, it's not always true. You could have some wiggles here, but, but in general, that's kind of the shape of a probability density function. And then, this statement simply says integrate this function. So compute the area under the curve, right? The function is positive, so the area under the curve is always the integral. So, so that's. So the area under the, the curve under this curve is exactly under the curve y equals f of x a between x between a and b is uh, equals the probability of this event. Okay. And also, um, I'm going to say this, but it's not co completely correct. But oftentimes, I mean, it has to be kind of a really weird distribution or density function for this not to be true. But, um, you know, the limit, if, if your probability distribution function is an increasing function and kind of... Um, not with too many wiggles, then the limit of the derivative at plus and minus infinity are both zero. So, so it is localized, okay? In that sense. Um, also, what's the integral from negative infinity to infinity? So the the improper integral of this density function. 
it's always one because this is the probability of the of, of x being negative infinity plus infinity and that's and that's the certain event, right? Okay, so all of this. All of this is kind of um, good to to uh, to keep in mind. Now, uh, just a footnote: if uh, if x is a discrete random variable, so by that we mean that it take only a discrete, let's say, countable number. set of values, so k1, k2, kn. Um, so k1 if if omega is in a certain event, right? So it's the event that x takes the value k1. k2 if it's in another event, right? That's another event. These are all uh, mutually disjoint events, right? And let's say k1 is less than k2, less than k3. Um, then, what's the probability distribution? I mean, I should, we should say, to be very precise, probability distribution function. Okay, so it's because it's a function on the real axis, it's on the real line. So this would be. Let's say k1 is here, k2 is here, k3 is here, k4, and so forth. So I'm plotting something that takes a discrete set of values and they're all positive. So, so how, how is the probability distribution function, function going to look like for this one? What's the probability that you uh, that your capital X is less than zero? Zero. So so zero and zero 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 all the way to k one, right? Now what's the probability that that the um, oops that the random variable is less than or equal than k one? Well, it's going to be exactly the probability that x is k1, right? And that's, that's the probability of the first event. Exactly. So it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a positive, well, right? It has to be positive, otherwise you wouldn't list it. So it has a jump there, right? And then it stays constant up to the next one, right? What's the probability that x is less than or equal than k2? Well, it's really the probability that x is k1 or x is k2, right? Which it really means is the probability of the union. And this being disjoint events, Probability of a union of two disjoint events is the sum of the probabilities. Right? So, so, it's so it's another step, right? So a, this would be the probability of A1 and the probability of A2. Right? So every, every time you have a step, by, by that amount, right? Now, if you are if you have an infinite set of values that, that, that the random variable can take, then this is going to continue and, and never, and, and eventually kind of converts to one, right? If it's a finite set, if it's a finite set of values that the, that the random variable can take, it's going to have a finite number of steps and then just going to level off to one. 
Okay. So, for instance, for this kind of probability, for, for this kind of random values, it doesn't quite make sense to talk about the density function, right? I mean, density function we mean the derivative of this piecewise constant function. So it would be zero everywhere except the at this uh, discrete set of points, right? So the, the density function is is important for the um, for the case when you don't have this kind of jumps, you don't have discrete set of, of values, you have but rather a continuous set of values. Okay, so uh, let's really quick let's talk about expectation of a continuous random variable. We talked about the expectation of a discrete random variable, but if now I have something that takes a continuous range of values, right? And here's, I mean, here's a case when, which is kind of the other extreme. It's not discrete, so it has a, discrete, a density function with a probability density or PDF. function, which is little f of x, right? Then the expected value of this random variable is defined, oops, is defined to be, again, it's It's this symbol which says summing up all the values of x multiply with the res respective probabilities. So it's it's an integration. It's an integral, but in this case it has it can be written explicitly in terms of the um, probability density. So it's integral of little x f of x dx or the way to think about this is, is almost like a change of variable. Let me let me go through two steps here. So this would be that the integral of excuse me. Um, yeah. This would be the integral of Px of omega d P of omega. Um, well, I don't know. Let me leave. Let me leave the p here. Now, if I'm going back to the real axis, I'm, I'm going to replace this with little x, and this with the. It's kind of hard to to explain this in, um, without going through the integration process explicitly, but this is. I don't know. That's not going to be helpful. Maybe skip all these steps until you see um, you see the formula that one, one uses most of the time. So expectation of x is x little f of x dx. Again, I cannot justify very well all these change of variables that took place here, but because because we haven't talked about measure theory much, but okay, so maybe maybe this is digestible, right? It's basically an integral of x with respect to f of x, um, but if not, then then this is just f little f of x or f prime capital F prime dx, right? So this is just going to be. So in essence, the way you compute the expectation is you multiply x with the probability density function and you integrate it between negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, and this is consistent with the definition for discrete random variable. What was the definition for discrete random variable? It was a, it was 
Right, let's say he takes the values k1, k through kn. Then it'll be kn times the probability that x takes the value kn, right? So this would be like pn. So this is a summation of k and pn. So instead of, yeah, it's instead of, um, instead of the, um, summation you have an integral and, you know, oftentimes you can actually take a limit, a continuous random variable is the limit of a, of a sequence of discrete random variables. So, so th those kind of, um, are well defined and what's the variance of a continuous random variable with probability distribution f well it's v of x of var of x is the integral from negative infinity to infinity of little x minus m squared f of x dx where little m is actually the expectation of, of, of capital X so so this is again this is just the expectation of the x minus m squared and what should say What's the probability density function of a of this random variable x minus m squared is the same as the probability density function of x? So it's it's it is this f, right? So so if you if you start from here, you sh well I don't know. Again, there there are some uh, kind of a jump from one to the other, um, right? Capital X gets replaced by little x. This is the real number. A little f of x shows up here in integrate from negative infinity to infinity, right? Is this novelty to, to, to any of you? It's okay if it is, but um, but that, so so uh, so if you have a random variable and you have a uh, uh, you know its probability density function, then this integral is going to give you the variance, okay? Again, this, this matches the case of discrete random variables, which would be, it's a series, right? And so in of, oftentimes, it's, this looks like a lot be a better uh, computation than a series computation, right? Okay, so, so actually, there's even more. So, so, so there's an even more general formula um, which if you have a random variable x and you compose it so you take you you apply another function to it right it's a composition so the one above would be or think about just taking the square of, of capital x right that would be a new random variable and you take the expectation of that well Anybody guess? Any guess what the, what this might be in terms of the integral density function? The density function? Hmm? Uh, I'm not saying what g is. Just, but if you want to think of g as, as x squared, then that's fine. If g is a square function, then this would be actually the square x squared. Okay, little x squared. Um, if g is sine function, this would be sine of x. Okay. So it really comes from that change of variables. But, but uh, so in general, it's just going to be g of x, g of little x times gaff of x. Okay. So now you can match this maybe. 
even better with that, right? So, so the expectation. So, so here the function g would be little x minus m squared, right? So that's what gets multiplied by f of x. Okay, so um, of course this is used in um, in um, for for uh, what's known momentum. So m moments, excuse me, of, of random variable. So you could talk about a square. That's the square of a random variable, right? And talk about the expectation of that. That will simply be integral of x squared, f of x, right? And so forth. So, so I was joking. A sine of x, I don't know if it will ever see, but powers of, right? Of a random variable that, that is sometimes uh, important to compute, so. Okay? Certainly the second power is important. Further powers are, are not so important. Okay, so let me um, say one more thing and then, then list the, the central limit theorem, okay? So uh, a very important example of a density function is the Gaussian density function. Or which is implies a normal distribution function. So, so it's just like that Poisson distribution that I we said uh, here. Here's a distribution. Okay. Um, we didn't say what the experiment was. We didn't say what the random variable was. Right. We just said. There are important uh, random variables in, in right, generic experiments for which that was a distribution, right? So same here, probably it's, it's good to, to think about if you haven't seen this before, is that there are, if there are certain, well, there are actually um, universal uh, random I mean, there experiments and uh, corresponding random variables for which uh, share this kind of special den density function and that is uh, we're going to use this notation So, um, there's a sigma here, so sigma in denominator. So, just to familiarize yourself, if I take, uh, excuse me, m, uh, m equals zero and sigma equals one, that's that would be kind of the normal, normal distribution. Then g of zero one of x is going to be what? 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the minus x square over 2. Yep. Exactly. So sigma will end up being the standard deviation for this random variable. For this, yeah, for this distribution. But again, uh, just to see the shape, this is, this is the, the special case, right? That's the normal distribution. Uh, and the one there is just a translate and possibly a, a change in, in scale, right, in the x in the x direction. So, so typically this is going to look right. Of course, this is the g zero one. So this is this is the standard. This is the normal distribution, um, and it has. It's a it's an even function. It has a peak at one, and what's the value? It's one over two squared of pi. What's the property? The important property that we one has to check is that the integral of this actually ends up being 
one, right? So that's that's basically where the this factor comes from because when you do the computation of just the integral of e to the minus x squared over two, integral of that for, over the whole real line, you end up with the square root of two pi. And that's an exercise you should have seen in calculus three. What's a hint for that? It's a nice. Uh, it's a change of variable to polar coordinates. Oh. So look in a Calc three book where it talks about change of coordinates from rectangular to polar coordinates in the plane, and this is going to be there as an example, as a computation. And it's, it's a very good exercise to do. Um, okay, so so again, that's that's the reason why they squared up 2 pi, right? Is because you want a probability density function to integrate to 1. Okay, so... Um, yeah, if I have time, I'll show you, but maybe it's, it's you know, uh, you should go on and try to look for it. For that computation on your own. Now, of course, um, what will be excuse, what will be for a general? Oops. M and sigma. The thing is just going to be shifted. It's going to have, have the same shape, of course, but it's going to be shifted and it's going to have. It's still going to have the integral to be one. Yeah, I mean it has to be. So that's where that's the reason for that factor in front, right? In the general, and the factor was one over sigma times two squared of pi. So this will be the one over sigma squared of two pi. The peak of this thing is not so important. The more important thing is actually the inflection points here. So if you're if you're really into calculus one stuff, you could take that function, differentiate it twice, and you're going to see that the 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 inflection points there are two inflection points, and they happen at plus and minus one for that thing, and for, and for this thing are going to happen at at sigma units away from the mean, so... <coughs> so, okay? And, uh, let's see, so, if that's the case, can you see that the expect expectation of this... So, two things, two computations that we're not gonna... I'm gonna just indicate, but not, not actually complete them. The expectation of, the, of such a random variable is gonna be The integral of x times that, right? And remember what I said, it's it's it has to do with that center of mass. So if I have that thing, what's the center of mass of this of, of the area under the curve? If the curve is like the symmetric like this, it's gonna be in the center, right? And where is the center? The center is at m, right? So that's so this Again, this is a substitution that you do in the integral, and you end up with, so this is by substitution rule, right? If you don't do this on your own, you're not going to appreciate the statements. As well as the variance, which is, you know, the, vari the variance is going to be little x minus m squared g of m sigma. And again, this is going to take some not a lot of work, but it's going to take some integration by parts, and you will end up. You will see that this is actually this exactly sigma squared. Okay. So. So this means that what's the standard deviation? Of x. Is precisely sigma. Okay. 
And of course, the mean is precisely m. So the, the, that's, yeah, okay. And let's just say one last thing is that, uh, so let, um, let me just say the following thing is that, um, is that there are two properties of the standard deviation. One is that the area under the curve between uh, within one standard deviation from the mean, so it's simply a computation, and it's 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 almost 68 percent, or it's close to 68 percent. So this is one standard deviation from the mean. And what is this saying in in terms of what is this saying in terms of probabilities? It simply says the probability of a random variable with this density function of of, of this random variable being between those two values is 68 percent, right, or close to it. So there's it's not an exact, yeah. Okay, so it's always important in this to be able to translate back to probabilities. Also, uh, there is a two standard deviations from the mean. That's ninety-five percent. Three standard deviations, probably ninety-eight or something. Uh, Ninety-nine point seven. Thank you. So this is two standard deviations. And again, uh, this means the probability of the random variable between m minus 2 sigma and plus 2 sigma is 95 percent. And you can keep going on and on, right? Well, 95 percent is kind of an important uh, number here. It's, it says that this is a 95 percent confidence in interval. So, uh, we're going to have to uh, Finish here for now, but this is the, the place where we can so we start talking about um, the central limit theorem. So, which is kind of dwarfs the the strong law of large numbers that we talked about previously, because it gives additional information and in, into what happens with a sequence of random variables that are identically distributed and independent. Um, so unfortunately we're going to um, quit there for now, but if you would like to take, start taking a look at, at these uh, solutions, at the problems that I assigned, and I think you should be able to uh, to do number, well, you can look at number one, uh, so the first first problem exercise two. It involves central limit theorem. So I would say uh, try to read the, the central limit theorem from any probability book or. Uh, yeah. Hmm? No, it's not online, but I'll try to put it online. Okay. And this should help you kind of get started at least interpreting how the problem should be you know uh, put into equations and stuff. Okay? I don't think every, yeah, not all problems involve um, central limit theorem, so. Okay? Thank you.